provides a tremendous cardio workout with minimal joint impact. So don't wait. Go to ddpyoga.com forward slash Austin and check out all the great deals DDP has for listeners of the Steve Austin Show. There's also the DDP Yoga Now app for working out on the go, available on iOS and Android. Again, go to ddpyoga.com forward slash Austin and be on your way to not only changing your life, but owning your life. The following program is a podcast1.com production. From Hollywood, California, by way of the Broken Skull Ranch, this is the Steve Austin Show. Give me a hell yeah. Hell yeah. Now, here's Steve Austin. All right, everybody, welcome to Steve Austin Show. I am coming to you from the mean streets of Los Angeles, California today. I'm over here at 317 Gimmick Street. Before I get into the open of this podcast, I'm looking at my computer and I'm reading about the Vegas gunman kills at least 59, injures 500, and shooting rampage. I'll tell you what, as I record the open of this podcast, it is October 2nd, 2017. It's 346 p.m. When I got up this morning, I got on my iPhone and kind of started going through the headlines. And I, man, I kind of did a double take this before I had my coffee. I had to say, man, what is going on? So, man, I started reading about it. Got some coffee. I came back into the room. I told my wife, I said, man, turn on your computer. You're not going to believe this. Anyway, man, some guy, I'll leave it at that. This is the family friendly show. Got up in the Mandalay Bay Hotel, knocked out two windows, and had a bunch of full automatic, I guess, machine guns, whatever they were. I'm not reading enough of this yet. Man, just started shooting into a country music concert. Jason Aldean was on the stage at the time. Killed 59 people, injured 500. And then, uh, I guess, in the time that it took to find where he was shooting from the window, uh, he shot himself, took the cowardly way out. And I tell you what, man, my, my heart, uh, my thoughts go out to anybody who lost a loved one. Uh, all those people affected by this, it is just absolutely despicable what this low life piece of scum did. And just absolutely shocking. And so I, I had to say that I, my thoughts are with anybody and everybody affected by this. And, I don't have any relatives there in Vegas that were at this show, but I mean, it affects me because, man, I feel for all these people, but I also just think you never know where you go, where you're going to turn to next, that something like this is going to happen again. It's just people are going absolutely crazy. Just, I don't understand it. I don't know why someone would want to do something like this. But it sure makes you scratch your head, it makes you wonder, and it makes you hurt for the people that were you know, directly involved in this, whether they, they were lost their life or lost the life of a loved one, a relative, etc. Absolutely baffling to me why someone would do that. And not all of the pieces of the puzzle have been put together yet, and maybe someone will make some headway and find out motivation why this guy would be driven to do such a dastardly act but man i tell you what las vegas uh anybody that was in, involved in this or was affected by this my thoughts are with you my heart goes out to you but with that being said i have a podcast to do and uh i had a great podcast today and i'm happy that you guys are gonna get a chance to listen to it i had to get my thoughts out there about las vegas before I could continue or even start the podcast, because that was first and foremost. And so at today's conversation, I'm talking with former competitive bodybuilder Dave Palumbo about the modified ketogenic diet. A lot of you people have been following me on the podcast, been following me on uh, Twitter or uh, Instagram, at Steve Austin BSR. You know, I've been flirting and kind of dabbling and messing with this ketogenic diet for quite some time. I started as long ago as when I sold my ranch and I was driving on the way back with my Chevy pickup and my trailer and I was stopping at fast food joints and I was just eating burgers and vegetables and throwing away the french fries and throwing away the bread. When I got back to Los Angeles, I kind of made it more of a concerted effort to follow a standard ketogenic diet. And the standard ketogenic diet calls for basically about 70% fats, about 20% protein or 25% protein, and the rest is going to be carbs. But 
fibrous carbs, nothing starchy, less than about 25 net grams. So I followed that blueprint for a pretty good while. But while I was following that blueprint, you know, I was still having a couple of beers every night or having a couple of shots of whiskey every night. Nothing crazy, nothing crazy at all. Very light or mild drinking, but I just wasn't making any headway. Made a little bit, I would say, because I was putting in the work in the gym, doing my weight training, training heavy, training hard, uh, or as heavy as my body will let me with all the surgeries, doing the cardio, putting the time in, but I just wasn't making enough progress. And so I started looking around, asking different people. Uh, you know, as you know, I had Mark Bell from uh, Super Training Gym in Sacramento on a podcast. Uh, Mark kind of uh, gave me the idea to go ahead and, hey, man, give a ketogenic diet a try. And so I did. So thanks to Mark for suggesting it. But as I kind of floundered and kind of just was trying to read the definition and apply everything and use all the calculators that you follow on the computer or online, I found everyone that you can think of, put together all these plans. And it's always one thing when you make a plan for someone else. But I find when I try to make a plan for myself, since I really, in the world of nutrition, don't know what I was doing, just would flip-flop around and change my diet. And so if I wasn't losing any weight or I stopped losing weight, well, I'd shift strategies and try something else. That's one of the biggest dieting mistakes I believe that you can make. Uh, and you'll come to find out in my conversation with Dave Palumbo uh, about his strategy uh, why this strategy worked and how he makes the changes. So anyway, uh, I'd been talking to Kevin Nash, you know, on and off. Me and Kevin talk, you know, once or twice a month for, for years and years. And people know he's one of my best friends. We're always talking about working out and getting in shape. And Kevin is a fitness freak and likes to keep in shape and look good. He kept mentioning Dave Palumbo's name. And I remember Dave from his competitive bodybuilding days, you know, 90s and 2000s. I mean, he was one of the biggest guys on stage, one of the most ripped guys on stage. And being a huge fan of bodybuilding and powerlifting, you know, I pretty much knew his career. But I didn't know that, you know, he was in the training business and consultation business, making programs out for not only elite bodybuilders, but also athletes and regular folks like myself. I'm not uh, an elite athlete. I'm pretty much a regular person at this stage in my life. And so, man, he had uh, mentioned Dave Palumbo's name so many times. I, I figured, man, I'll get in contact with this guy and see if he can uh, make a diet up for me. And it turns out, you know, through my research, I'd found out also well, in my search for ketogenic strategies that Triple H, Paul from WWE, was on a ketogenic diet and you know Paul has someone train him and Stephanie and they're busy as hell so they had the workout uh, part of their lives in place and so Paul was looking to Dave Palumbo for nutritional advice well here's one thing I know about Triple H if that guy is going to do something or work with somebody he's a thought long and hard about who he's going to work with because the guy thinks about everything he does. He's very smart about what he does. And Paul is a fitness fanatic to begin with. He has been since the day I met him and has always taken great care of his body. So if he's going to trust Dave Palumbo with his nutrition, I figured Dave had to know what he's going to be talking about. And again, from looking at him on stage, he was huge and he was ripped. Hey, dude, I'm just trying to get lean. I'm not trying to hit a bodybuilding stage. So I reached out to Dave, and we started talking. I sent him the information uh, that he wanted, what I was eating. We'll cover this in the podcast, uh, what my weight was, the fact that I was going to have to send him some uh, pictures of what I looked like each and every week, update pictures so he could see my progress. I would weigh in every three to five days and send him progress. Uh, photos and uh, you know that way he could look at the weight look at my pictures and see you know what direction we needed to move with respect to the diet and as I say in the podcast you know I'd been researching standard ketogenic diets high fat moderate protein low carb I was down with that so all of a sudden I get diet so all of a sudden I get Dave's program and it's high protein medium fat low carb and from everything that i had been reading hey all that protein is going to kick me out of ketosis gluconeogenesis is going to happen and my body's going to start making glucose or sugar from excess protein so i was hesitant to follow the diet i got a text message from dave 
I need you to send me those update photos. We got to get you ready for your show, Broken Skull Challenge. So I said, man, I've already hired this guy. Let me just go ahead and see if I can follow his strategy. And it's counterintuitive to what I'm reading. Everybody says it's too much protein. It's going to kick me out of ketosis. So I started following the program. I sent Dave some pictures. And I remember, you'll hear me talk about this in the podcast. I flew up to Denver. I think it was a time on the Stone Cold podcast when I talked to Triple H. And I remember seeing Vince McMahon backstage. And he goes, God dang, Steve. He says, what are you weighing? And I said, man, about 275. And, you know, I could see by the look on his face, he was asking me because he thought I was way too heavy. And if you go back and you look at those older podcasts, you can see how bloated my face was. It was just, it was, I wasn't out of control. I was 275, but 275 is heavy for me. He goes, Steve, you got to cut it back. I looked at Vince and in the eyes and said, Vince, I said, I'm not eating anything. And I was telling him the truth. <laughs> but I was drinking stuff. I was drinking too much beer and too much whiskey. So anyway, uh, looking at that, I kind of started this this journey. So I give you that story. If you look back uh, at those old uh, podcasts on the network, you'll see where I was coming from, from looking at me physically. Uh, by the time I started working with Dave, I'd whittled myself down from 275, 270, 65, finally down to 260. And that's kind of where I hit that brick wall. That's where I reached out to Dave for help. And one of the things, you know, when he, he asked me, to send him my diet, I did. And I said, every night before I go to sleep, I have about three or four ounces of bourbon, which I did. That was my nightcap. And that's not a whole lot of alcohol. This was toned down from the podcast in Colorado. So anyway, he says, let's drop the alcohol for seven weeks and we'll see what kind of progress we can make. So it's a funny thing. When you get someone to help you with the diet, it really helps you out because First of all, I'm a goal-oriented person, and when I try to do something for myself, nine times, 9.5 times out of 10, I'm going to do it. But with that diet and me liking to have a drink every now and then, and that's from uh, back from uh, my past way before wrestling, that beer drinking and all that stuff I was doing, that wasn't a work. That was a shoot. I like to have a glass of beer, and I like to have a glass of whiskey, tequila, broken skull margaritas, whatever. But they had to stop, and they had to slow down in the name of fat loss. So I dropped that out. Dave said, that's the greatest pre-bed workout shake I've ever heard of. He goes, do you just like to drink or do you use it to help you sleep? Well, I think both. Maybe it helped me sleep a little bit, but I like to drink. But you got to cut that out. And so the reason I'm talking to you about my diet is because I know that many people are in the same boat as me, wanted to lose weight or maybe need to lose weight. And... Man, I was avoiding the pink elephant in the room, and that was that nightly dose of alcohol. I had to eliminate that, and hiring a coach, uh, someone I had to be accountable to, other than myself, you know, I had to eliminate that alcohol, and I stuck to my workouts. I followed everything to a T, and I started winding down to my current body weight from 258.6 when I met Dave, and then as I currently sit here at 242, my lowest weight was 241.3. I'll probably get down to maybe the high 230s. But nonetheless, I adapted the concept also provided by David Clark, the ultra runner who was on the show, the author of Out There, A Story of Ultra Recovery. When he was talking about, hey, man, if you want to be a pro athlete, you need to live like a pro athlete. And he was just trying to run. So he said, I need to eat like a runner. And I needed to eat like a person who's trying to lose weight. Uh, I don't want to say I want to eat like a bodybuilder because I'm not a bodybuilder, but I needed to eat and drink like I wanted to lose weight. And so I did. I dropped out the alcohol. And so once I put all the pieces together, followed Dave's program, I got down to 242. Now you'll hear all these people, all the experts to say, hey man, high protein uh, or 340 grams of protein is too much on a ketogenic diet. Well, you'll hear Dave's argument why it's not. And you'll hear my thoughts on when I constructed my diet and that I was lower in protein, I was high in fats, and I didn't really feel that good eating all that food all the time. At first, I thought I was a kid in a candy store, being able to eat Jimmy Dean sausage and eggs, bacon and eggs every single morning for breakfast, just the, the you know, butter, you know, Thousand Island dressing, just, just a whole kit and caboodle. Hey, man, you do that for a few weeks in a row, it ain't all it's crank, cranked up to be. 
and I feel better eating healthy foods. And that's what Dave had me eating. My fats came from good sources. My protein came from lean sources. And there was just a whole turnaround. So anyway, that, that is the, the podcast for today. And uh, you'll hear me talk about some of the things. One of the things I want to say is if you undertake any kind of diet strategy or, or if it's keto, which was very effective for me, and I'm, I'm maintaining it for or the lifestyle for quite some time because I like the effects and I like the lower carbs in my system, as you'll hear uh, Dave body type me later in the podcast. But it's not a magic bullet. There are trade-offs. You got to sacrifice something, whether you're going to go low carb or no carb or whatever your strategy is. There, there's not a magic bullet. It is consistency and it is sticking to the process and trusting the process and putting in the work for you to make everything happen. And uh, that's what the podcast is about. This is my journey. Everybody may have a completely different story. Someone might say, hey, Steve, BS, this is the best way to go about a ketogenic diet. Whatever floats your boat. This is what worked for Steve Austin and Dave Palumbo helped me accomplish it. So this is my story. I'm sticking to it. You have your story. There are different strategies to employ. You should think and research about all these strategies before embarking on the journey yourself and seeing what best suits your lifestyle or or your makeup. So the podcast with Dave Palumbo is coming up next. But before I get to Dave Palumbo and my modified ketogenic diet, hear me out about a great new show headed to the CW this season. Coming up this Monday, the CW brings you to the front line of drama with the new military series, Valor. Two special ops helicopter pilots breaking boundaries and defying all expectations. Their bravery in the face of impossible odds earned them the distinguished flying cross for Valor. But together they are finding that truth is the first casualty of war. During their last mission, something went wrong, something no one is talking about. So now they have secrets, but they're also patriots and refuse to leave any man behind. What would you do if you had to break the rules to do what's right? Would you stay grounded and step in line or go to any lengths to learn the truth? They share secrets, go on clandestine missions, risk life and limb with only each other to depend on. How close would you get to the only person who really knows you? It's explosive new drama that pushes the boundaries between military discipline and human nature. The new series is right on target. Valor, the world premiere after the season premiere of Supergirl, this Monday, only on The CW. My name is Raven, professional wrestling superstar, raconteur extraordinaire, and master of the Lombada, the forbidden dance. Come join me and my sidekick, Busby, for a live, live podcast of The Raven Effect. Yes, sir The Raven Effect, my podcast with Busby. That's live, 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 live on Thursday, October 5th at 9.30 as part of the LA Podcast Festival Preview Night at the Hollywood Improv. Come join us for this most momentous occasion. Tickets are just $15. That's it? I think we should charge more. Eh. Anyway, they're available at hollywood.improv.com. Hollywood.improv.com. Again, it's the Raven Effect Live. <coughs> Easy for you to say. Hit the Hollywood Improv on Thursday, October 5th at 9.30 p.m. Go to Hollywood.improv.com for tickets and a free cookie. But there's no free cookie? Oh, well, quote the Raven, nevermore. This is the Steve Austin Show. Hey man, yeah. it's uh, you know it's good to finally talk with you and see you at the yeah. same time because we've been going back and forth on uh, t- uh, telephone, just a lot of text messages, and then I had to start right. texting you photos of my progress. And right. when we first started hooking up, I was like, eh, you know, I'm kind of hesitant to send pictures of myself because I'm really in not that good a condition. And I know you work with regular everyday people I- all the time, but you also yeah. work with elite bodybuilders, which you were at one time yourself. So, sure. nonetheless, it's it's great to uh, to talk to you and uh, pick your brain. I'm uh, obviously a little bit more simplified than you. That's why I came to you for your help. It was interesting because uh, I was a fan of yours, you know, from basically your whole competitive career. Well, in the 90s and 2000s. And uh, so I followed your career. And then all these years later, I never figured I would be working with you on a fitness program or eating program to get me leaner. So it's a pleasure right. to, to, to pick your brain for a little bit on the yeah. podcast. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Hey, so what were your original designs or plans in life when you graduated from college with a Bachelor of Science, three years of medical school? What was the original game plan? The game plan was be a doctor, right? I mean, you go to med school, I'm in school, and, you know, I, I was kind of like one of these things, like, I, I just didn't want to, like, you know, start working <laughs> you know, a real job. So I said, after college, let's go to med school. I got in, you know, it was great, you know, because it's very it was very hard in the 90s to get into med school. So I think, well, I'm smart enough, let me go. And the first two years, you know, the first – week of, of med school is everything you learned in college. They rehash it in one week. And so I'm like, oh, this is going to be pretty crazy. And but then, you know, you get into the groove and, you know, it's all the first two years is all classroom stuff. It's a lot of labs and anatomy and physiology. And I loved all that because, you know, I was into bodybuilding at this time. I had switched gears. I was a runner in, in college, but I got into bodybuilding and I, I was liking the way I was looking, seeing the changes. And, and I'm understanding the physiology of what's going on, which is really important because, you know, a lot of people don't understand what they're what's actually going on in their body. You know, and I was able to make decisions and nutritionally and supplement wise that were based on real science rather than just what people were telling me in the gym to do. And I understood the mechanisms of what was going on. So that really empowered me, even though my physique didn't reflect what I knew yet. I knew that I was doing the right thing and I was making tremendous progress. And I think that was a huge, huge thing. The problem was I got to the point where I got to the third year of med school and now you're in the hospitals doing rotations, working with doctors. And I'm realizing that these doctors are all they're doing is treating symptoms and giving freaking prescriptions. And I'm like, this is boring. I'm like, this is stupid. I like the physical diagnosis process, but but no one cared anything about why these people were getting sick to begin with, why they were overweight, why they were diabetic, why they were this, why they had just it, that wasn't a, pari uh, a prerogative, a prior, excuse me, a priority. And because of that, I became disillusioned with the whole medical field. And I, and I felt like I was wasting a lot of time sitting in a hospital, you know, working 36 hours and I'm taking and I'm doing just menial things. And just I, I just felt like I was wasting time. Something told me in, internally, you know, you have that like you have that kind of monitoring system inside everyone's body where, you know, if you're doing the right thing, or you know, you're not. And my intuition said, get out. And I, I'm not one to quit anything. So I said, you know, I'm going to take a year off from school, something I never did before. And as soon as I got out and I immersed myself in the bodybuilding world 100 percent, it just was like magic happened. You know, I started having opportunities uh, uh, open up for me. I started doing well in bodybuilding. I was happy all the time. I started writing for magazines because they, they saw I had the ability to write. You know, my father was a, was a writer. So I had the science background with the writing talent. And it just it was the right thing to do. And I never looked back after that. It seems, and then obviously the science background played into your bodybuilding career because when you when you hit the stage in your first contest, you were about a buck sixty eight, and you were yeah, going to yeah. compete, you know, close to two seventy two hundred seventy five pounds. Now, I didn't know that you were a soccer player. I didn't know you had a uh, long distance running background. I would have never thought that looking at your physique. Looking back, uh, would you describe yourself as a true mesomorph? You know, it's a good question. I, I think I'm more um, probably ectomesomorph. You know, I'm not. No one's a real true mesomorph. Everyone wants to believe they are, but I don't think anyone is. I think I, I err a little towards the ectomorph because I I don't put body fat on. I have zero body fat. Like, and it's really hard for me to gain weight. The good thing about what I was doing is that I have an enormous appetite. So if you have a, a very fast metabolism with an enormous appetite, it really works to your advantage because everything you eat gets turned to muscle. You never put fat on. You're just limited by how much food you can actually put down your throat. You know, and that's something that I, I pride myself on being very good at. But during your days, when you hit the stage, you were one of the biggest guys on stage and you were always one of the most ripped guys on stage. So yeah. again, that goes back to you always been a very lean person. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, at first I had a diet. It was it wasn't so easy. As I added more and more muscle to my physique, my metabolism like be, rose to epic proportions. Now, I have a theory also. I was a long distance runner for about I'd say about four years where I'm talking like 10, 12 miles a day of running. And, you know, runners don't hypertrophy muscle. They, their, their muscle becomes more energy efficient, meaning that the, the metabolic enzymes adapt so that you can oxidize fats faster to make more available fuel present because remember long distance running doesn't use carbohydrates as a fuel source it's a fat fat fuel type of activity at, at a certain level you know when you're run, racing it's a different story and i think that i permanently altered my metabolic rate you know from that um and also you got to remember uh, the muscle cells of, of long distance runners and endurance athletes don't get bigger but they do still produce more nuclei so you're getting more you actually are producing new cells. They're just not getting large because it's not functional. So you take a person who now has more cells as an endurance athlete and you and you change their, their activity. You take away the endurance and you put pure 
hypertrophy, hyper, uh, hypertrophying exercises in there, like you know, weight training. And now I have a better predisposition to build muscle. I think that's why my legs grew really, really quickly. Uh, whereas my upper body was a little more difficult because obviously I wasn't putting my upper body in under the same oxygen deficit scenarios that I was doing with my lower body. And, you know, so I think that the, the, the running had some kind of, and I've seen this with other body, uh, other runners that switched to bodybuilding. My friend Roman Fritz in Germany was doing the same thing. And he also doesn't get fat. I think you know, we permanently altered our, our metabolic rates to a certain degree. Okay, we're going to eventually get to the keto diet that you put me on. And I came to you for your advice. I was talking to one of my friends. I've been talking to him for years, Kevin. Nash. Yes. And he had said, mentioned your name in several conversations. And so finally, you know, I reached a point of frustration. I said, you know what, you know, let me reach out and give this guy a call and see if he can help me out. And, and so that's how we hooked up. But j just to continue a little bit uh, more with your evolution as a bodybuilder, from you starting out with that running background at about a buck 68, obviously with the bodybuilding lifestyle, the, the gear, but we're talking diet. Uh, mm -hmm. And you seem to be the keto guy when people talk about bodybuilding keto. Now, it's a modified keto with higher protein, moderate fats. But in those formative years, were you consuming tons of carbs to help you grow to the length that you, to the, the size that you grew? I, I did the conventional bodybuilding diet back in, in the early 90s when I started. First of all, I put 100 pounds of muscle on in five years. I just want to say that. And when I tell people, when they hear that, they get crazy because they're like, I want to do that too. But I'm like, you know what? I never looked at it as putting 100 pounds of muscle on. I looked at it as putting a quarter of a pound of muscle on every week. And if you do that consistently over five years, you'll put 100 pounds of muscle on. So I never, ever allowed a week to go by, a day to go by, an hour to go by where I wasn't doing the right thing in terms of training, eating, resting. So, you know, I was a meticulous lunatic when it came to that. And I think that's one of the reasons why I was very successful. But when I first started dieting, you know, the first the bodybuilding diet of the 80s and early 90s was high protein, very lean protein, so it's just tuna and chicken and stuff like that, fish and rice, potatoes or oatmeal. No one ate fat. It was, a, it was a zero fat diet and that worked to a certain degree when I first started. But what happened at some point was I stopped gaining weight. I couldn't, I just couldn't get any bigger. I, it was probably around the two, maybe 25 mark. I could not gain one more pound. It didn't matter how much tuner I jammed down my throat, how many shakes I, I downed, I wouldn't gain weight. And I remember one day I told the story before. I went out, a couple of my friends and I, after we, the gym, we said, you know what, let, we don't want to eat the, the typical whatever our, whatever lunch we pack. Let's go to McDonald's. Now, I hadn't had McDonald's in probably since I was a kid because when I was a runner, I didn't eat any junk food. And we go to McDonald's and literally, I swear to you, I, I said, well, if I'm going to go, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat anything I want. And I ate probably 10 cheeseburgers, probably two large fries. Um, I ate so much food and, and then people started looking at me like like really weird. And I'm like, what, what's, what are you guys looking at me for? They said, your veins, they're, they're expanding. And, you know, cause I was always very, very vascular and my veins just were huge. And I was, my muscles got engorged and I looked like, a, and I, I went to the bathroom and I said, what the hell are you guys talking about? We, we were posing in the bathroom, you know, typical, you know, 20 yeah. year old bodybuilders. And they're like, you look like a freak. And I didn't understand what was going on. And I think, well, maybe it was from the salt. When I got home that next day, and when I woke up the next morning and I went to the gym to train with these guys, they're like, what the hell? Now they thought I was taking some kind of special supplement I wasn't telling anyone. And I said, let's go back to McDonald's today. And we probably did that three, four days in a row. And I seriously probably put on about five pounds of muscle in that, in that first 10, 12 days that I was doing that. And I said, wait a second. Something's going on here. You know, it's not salt. It's, it's, it's not McDonald's has a secret recipe. What does McDonald's have that I'm not doing? And I said, fat. There's fat in this food. I must, I have a feeling I'm I'm depriving myself. So I start now. I started pulling out the books, you know, the textbooks. Because remember, the internet really wasn't out yet at that right. point. I'm going through it and I'm like realizing that you know what? There's essential fatty acids that no one's talking about. These are uh, fats that your body can't synthesize on its own. And I'm like, I'm no one's taking these things in. I said, I wonder if you know if we're if if as bodybuilders we're fat deprived because. And then I started studying more and I started realizing carbohydrates are not an essential nutrient. They're just a fuel source. But fats are. So I started incorporating more fats into my diet. And I realized that I, I, I was able to cut my protein back a lot more. Instead of eating four, five, six hundred grams of protein a day, I could eat, you know, 300, 350. And I could eat, you know, 150 grams of fat a day. And I was growing better processing my food better. I wasn't all like bloated from all the protein I was eating. And I, I, that was the magic bullet. I said, holy mackerel, 
I discovered something no one realizes. It, fat is necessary for muscle growth. And it doesn't have to be McDonald's, but it has to be, you know, it has to be a strategy. And so I started saying, well, I started analyzing fats and without getting into too much detail, I realized there were three categories, you know, the, the saturated fats, the polyunsaturated, the monounsaturated. And I started taking in certain amounts of each fat and playing around with the different ratios. And I saw a huge change in my physique, uh, so much so that I was growing at a rate that people thought, you know, this guy has some kind of drug that we don't have. And it wasn't the case. I was doing exactly the same thing. It was just that I, I had the, the secret to what was going on diet wise. And I modified that when I when I started dieting for shows. I started saying, well, why am I going to change my strategy before a show if fats are essential? Why don't I just cut the carbs back and raise the fats up? And I would do that. But I didn't get rid of carbs. And I started saying, well, you know, it's working, but I don't feel so good, you know, when I'm really this low carb. So I started studying about ketosis and the Atkins diet. And, you know, Dr. Atkins, basically, his theory was eat whatever the freak you want. Just don't eat carbs because carbs cause insulin release. And if you don't eat carbs, your brain will switch its metabolism and stop burning carbs or looking for carbs. And it'll start using fats. And the type of fats the brain uses are called ketones. They're, uh, they're conversion processes. Uh, they're fatty acids that can convert it to these things called ketone bodies. And your brain uses them as fuel. And I said, so I said, let me try to get rid of the carbs. So I got rid of the carbs and I actually felt better after a couple of days. Your head clears up. You don't get cravings. You don't get mood swings. You feel good. Your energy levels are good. And I said, you know what? The number one reason people fail on their diet is because they, they're moody and, and hungry and, and, and they miss their, you know, miss eating the foods they want. I'm a machine. I could do any kind of diet, but for the normal person, right. this would be, have to be a great diet. So I started realizing, let me start formulating. I said, Atkins never really gave rules. Most people ate too much fat and they ate bad sources of fat. I said, what if I actually design a performance angle on this diet? High protein, moderate fat, okay, just enough to get you through, and, and low carbs. And that's where the Palumbo ketogenic diet came from. It just came from a performance aspect. In other words, combining bodybuilding with the tenets of what the Atkins diet entailed, and I just made it you know, for the athlete. So then when you were still competing, you came up with this diet. How yeah. many carbs would you be eating before you dropped them out, then you say? You know, I, I found that I liked the way I felt better on no carbs. So what I would do is I would eat more protein and more fat and cut the carbs back, and I didn't miss it. And what, but the only thing I realized was that I knew that uh, thyroid hormone, especially the active thyroid hormone known as T3, uh, is very dependent on insulin. So if your insulin levels are really low, what invariably happens is that your body stops converting thyroxine hormone into the active metabolite T3, and then you'll slow your metabolism down, and basically the diet stops working. So what I did was I designed, and it was really – uh, something that I was, you know, I always liked to do anyway. I didn't realize what I was doing when I did it, but I like to have a cheat meal once a week. Once a week where I'd give myself one meal to eat whatever I wanted. I felt that it stimulated metabolism. Didn't know how, but then I, after studying, I realized that it was doing this by spiking insulin and keeping that thyroid conversion to the active form, moving it at, at, at optimal levels. And so that's, that's all I did. I would have the protein and fat during the week. On Saturday night, I'd go out, I'd eat whatever I wanted, I'd go to all-you-can-eat sushi, because I had a fast metabolism, so the real, I couldn't do any, I couldn't eat enough food in one sitting to do any damage. So it's not something you would re recommend to any human being, it's specific to you, you could get away with it, although you do have me on a once-a-week cheat meal, which helps me after we got through several months of diet. Right, but I. But if you said to me, "Can I go to Dunkin' Donuts and have a dozen donuts and and, and, and a Baskin Robin ice cream?" I'd say, "No, you'll get you, you won't be able to metabolize all those calories." But if you say to me, "Can I go to an Italian restaurant and get a plate of pasta and a dessert?" I'd be like, "Yeah, no problem," because that's reasonable. You want to just stimulate the 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 insulin release so that your body spikes. And also, don't forget all those carbs you're eating get stored as glycogen because your glycogen stores, which is analogous to the gas tank in your car are very low when you're on a ketogenic diet. So once a week, if you kind of refill the tank, so to speak, it gives you a little more fuel for the first, you know, three or four days of the week, you'll feel better in the gym. And then, of course, by the end of the week, you know, you're starting to feel low again, you know. If I had to throw a number or you had to throw a number on the carbs for that cheat meal as just a general guideline, yeah. what would you throw that number at? 100 grams, 150 grams, 200? Steve Austin, 150 grams. Dave okay. Palumbo, you know, 500 grams. Uh, Mrs. Jones, you know, 100 grams. So it depends on the person. You got to you know their metabolism. That's where a coach comes in. Coaching is very important in this because it seems easy to do, but it's very hard to, to – and you know this. You were having this problem. It's very hard to advise yourself because you look in the mirror and you make all the wrong decisions. 
because your instincts are all off. You could probably tell someone else what to do, but it's very hard to tell yourself what to do. So then how important does it uh, come into what you do as a diet coach to look at someone's body type and say, okay, uh, mesomorph, endo, ecto? Uh, because well, let, let, let me ask you, from the pictures you have seen of me, if you saw me on YouTube wrestling to see my yeah. body in its totality, how yeah. would you describe my body type? Yeah, I, well, I'll, I'll tell you, I think I'm an yeah. uh, athletic endomorph. <laughs> I think you're a meso endomorph. If you had, a, if you wanted me to give you a classification, okay, uh, you grow well, but yet you do you have stubborn fats, you know, stuff going on. Now, the good thing about the way I classify you as 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 a is a decent carbohydrate burner, not a good carbohydrate burner. Right. So, off if I did an off season, if you were a bodybuilder and you came to me and you said, let's do an off season program, I would give you moderate carbs. High protein, moderate fat, moderate carbs. You'd never get a high carb diet because you're the kind of guy that would get fat and a big roll around your gut and everything like that. Likewise, if you if I diet you, I know I can push your body harder because I know your body will hold that muscle too. You're not going to lose muscle. Whereas someone like myself, if I push myself too hot, too hard on the diet, too much cardio, I'll actually eat up muscle. So you have a good metabolism in the sense that you, you no matter what you do, you're not losing muscle. So if you were to work with anybody, I know you're, you're kind of known as a keto guy, but you don't necessarily put everybody on a keto diet because there's not one strategy for every person. So no. how do you go about making that decision? Because I came to you and I said, hey, man, mm -hmm. I've done it all. I'm kind of stuck. I'd like to try keto. I've tried it in the past. I gave up on it, but I'd like you to take me through it. Yeah. But that's not necessarily the way you would break down or put everybody on a, a program. Right. Well, you know, bodybuilders are, you know, especially the elite bodybuilders are very um, genetically blessed. So a lot of them don't fit the rules. Agreed. Um, you know, there are some guys that can't eat fat. I, they will, they, these guys are, are such muscle builders that if I give them too much fat, they will never lose weight. They'll just keep building muscle while they're on a diet on like no calories. You'll be like, holy mackerel, how the hell are these guys? So you have to be almost like Sherlock Holmes. You have to ask the right questions. You have to be a very, you have to have very good powers of observation. And you have to be able to know your client. You can't just treat everyone like like a, a template or textbook. That's not to say that your diet that I gave you wouldn't be the same diet I gave someone else who was in the same metabolic situation that you're in. So you know, you came to me and said, "Look, I'm I'm doing this ketogenic diet. It's not really I'm not losing weight." And then I have to ask the questions. Well, what are you eating? I know you're an athlete. I know you train with weights in the gym, and, and I know you are under eating protein. So I'm saying, here's a guy who's, who's starving his body of protein. There's no way his body is going to let go of stored body fat if it thinks it's deprived in anything. So, and if you notice, all the things that I recommended you take, in addition to the uh, the food you're eating, supplement wise, are things to prevent your body from thinking that it's in a, in a deprived state. If I don't, I'm giving you an essential fatty acid supplement because if you don't eat that stuff in your food. Even if you're on low calories, your body will think it's fat deprived. And if your body thinks it's fat deprived, it's not going to let go of fat in your trouble areas. Men around their waist, women in their butt. Okay. Uh, you asked me when I got in touch with you, hey, man, you're going to send me your diet, tell me what you're eating, your weight, and then send me a picture from the front and back. Right. So I sent you everything that I was eating. And you go, this was, uh, I'd started flirting with the idea of a keto diet some months before I got in contact with you. And this is all about standard ketogenic diet, which is higher fat, moderate to low protein, and probably under 20 net grams of carbs. So that's in the ballpark that I was at. And I also told you, well, right before I go to sleep, I drink three to four ounces of bourbon. And you, you emailed me back. You said, that may be the greatest uh, pre-bed, pre-sleep uh, uh, shake I've ever heard of in my life. He goes, do you, do you just like to drink or does it make you go to sleep? And I was like, no, I just like to drink. <laughs> So I started off with a standard keto diet, and uh, just from looking on my iPhone here, just give me a second. When I shot you, I, I won't go through the details of the food. I'll just mm. say it was lots of eggs, bacon, cheese, avocado, uh, protein, flaxseed oil, chicken thighs, and real butter. And so I sent you those ingredients, th those food items. It came out to, give or take, 244 grams of protein. Uh, net carbs was 13, and my fat was at about 200 grams of fat, and alcohol was at 31 grams. <laughs> and you sent me a diet back, which was at about 350 grams of protein, 23 grams of carbs, and 134 grams of fat, zero alcohol, 
where did I go wrong? Dave, I looked on all the, all. I, if there's a calorie calculator on the internet, I have seen it. Then I started going to the keto calculators, the standard ketogenic diet versus the modified ketogenic diet versus the cyclic ketogenic diet. I don't know that I went wrong, but I wasn't losing weight because when you added up all the macros, we were within two or 300 calories of each other but I wasn't really progressing. They did a great study at, at the National Institute of Health where they took three groups of people, all obese, borderline type 2 diabetics, but not on any, any kind of um, medication. And they said to these people, listen, we're going to give you two shakes to drink. We're not going to tell you what's in them. We want, them to, we want you to add them to your current diet. We don't want you to change the food you're eating. We don't want you to work out if you haven't worked out. Just keep doing everything you, you're doing. Just add these two shakes. Now, the calorie proponent people would think that, well, if you add two shakes of uh, you know, 400 calories uh, per day, you're going to gain weight, right? You're going to get fatter if you're overweight already. And you know, group one did exactly that. They got fatter, the waist circumference increased. Group two, nothing happened. Group three, they lost body fat, increased lean muscle, waist got smaller. Adding, adding, 200, adding 400 calories a day. And when they looked at the results, they realized that group one was drinking carbohydrates. So carbohydrates have what we call a negative partitioning effect on the body. They basically tell the body store fat. The second group took in soy protein exclusively. Soy protein, which is very low in branched-chain amino acids, okay, which are important to the muscle building process, nothing happened to. So the body's just metabolized the protein off. The, the third group who took whey protein isolate in, um, they gained muscle and lost body fat. And it, it made sense because when you take in sources of protein that are high in branch chain amino acids, animal sources of, of, of protein, whether it be whey protein or eggs or beef or chicken or fish, um, these branch chain amino acids that are found within the protein sources themselves have, an, have almost like a drug-like effect on the body. They instruct the muscle cells, specifically through something called mTOR, to start building muscle. It doesn't matter if you train or not. It's just it happens. It's what's called a positive partitioning food. Now, to fuel that process of building muscle, the body will use stored body fat for this. So just by adding these calories, you're, the, the, these people built muscle and lost fat. Now, imagine if you combine that with weight training what happens. So when you combine the right foods, the, the positive partitioning foods, those are lean sources of protein, essential fatty acids, fibrous carbs, your body will just naturally build muscle and store, uh, excuse me, build muscle and burn body fat. If you take in negative partitioning foods, carbohydrates, saturated fats, okay, sugars, you're going to store calories. So what I did basically was I, I skewed your diet more in, 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 uh, in the in favor of these positive partitioning foods, knowing very well that your protein requirement also is much higher because of your weight training, um, the standard ketogenic diet addresses the average you know couch potato that doesn't do anything and that wants to be lazy and wants to eat the same junky foods they always ate. So they give them the same foods. They just take the carbs away from them. It's a lower carb. I mean, it's a lower protein, higher fat diet. It works theoretically because insulin is still low. But it's certainly not going to give you a nice-looking physique that's that's muscular and lean. Well, it's it's very interesting because, man, when you start talking standard ketogenic diet, I mean, you have your diehards that stick to the high fat, and they're talking about seventy percent body fat, around twenty percent protein, give or take, right. and then you know just a few carbs. And they will argue the point that if you eat too much protein through gluconeogenesis, your body's going to convert protein into glucose, and therefore that will knock you out of ketosis. And so when you first kicked me this diet, I was hesitant to start it because I had done all my research on standard keto. I've got to know more than this guy. Here's what <laughs> Wikipedia says. Here's what all these websites say. And, you know, you sent me the diet, and I, I didn't respond to you for about a week or 10 days. And you kicked me another email. You said, hey, man, how you doing on that diet? We need to get you ready for Broken Skull Challenge. And I said, well, you know, I've already talked to this guy. We're working together. I need to answer him. So I said, hey, uh, I'll get started on on the program i just needed some reaffirmation about was this the right way to go because it went against everything that i'd read on a damn computer but <laughs> and, and i hired you to help me out but i was i was i was a doubter so i said f it i'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt and do what he says because his track record speaks for itself so it took me for you know seven to ten days dave frankly to buy in and then <laughs> once i did the weight started coming up, but to, to what, what do you say to the people that are just the, the standard, and, and I'm not saying anything negative about standard keto diets, if that, that's what works for you and it, it gets you results, more power to you, because the whole time when I'm eating Jimmy Dean sausage, eggs, and bacon for breakfast, I'm thinking, man, I don't know how the hell this is supposed to work. 
because I'm eating a bunch of shit that really ain't supposed to be that good for you. And you, and you, your first few attempts at a keto diet, you're thinking, hey, man, this is great because you get a couple of drinks in you. I mean, these are the dream foods that you want to eat. But then all of a sudden, you start living on this stuff for a couple of weeks at a time. It's like, uncle, I want some variety or I want something healthy because I feel like grease. So yeah. let's talk about high protein conversion to gluco, gluconeogenesis to convert that to glucose and knocking you out of ketosis. Break that down for me, Dave, All because right. the diet you created for me has worked wonders, and we'll go through the paces as we go forward. But speak to me about standard keto modified blood sugar right. and all that. Now, you got to remember, the term gluconeogenesis literally means the production of new glucose, and that occurs in the liver and somewhat in the kidneys, and that's always going on in your body. Whether you're, no matter what diet you're on, you're always producing glucose from amino acids, you know, at a, at a small rate. Uh, that's why, you know, if you ever talk to a type 1 diabetic who produces no insulin, not only do they take insulin with their meals, they take it a long acting insulin that works like while they're sleeping at night and during the day because their bodies are producing glucose even if they're not eating sugar or, or carbs. So uh, that always happens. Now, the question is, why would more protein that you're eating convert to glucose? Well, if you ate just protein with no fat in it, your body would be looking for a fuel source, right? And if you're only eating protein, the, the obvious choice was your body would convert some of that protein to glucose so that your body has a fuel source. That's why a, a pure protein diet doesn't work. You can't just stay on protein and nothing else. You're going to convert some of it to glucose and you're going to just feel like crap because it's not an efficient process. So, But if you give the body a fuel source, fat, Okay, like a car, like a hybrid car. A hybrid car can use gas or it can use electricity. If you give the body a fuel source, okay, and your brain switches into ketosis, now there's no need for glucose. The only time your body, you, Steve Austin, are using glucose is when you're in that gym hitting the weights. And maybe, you, maybe you're using 35 to 40 grams of carbs for that entire workout. That's it. And you, you have n enough of that just indirectly from the foods you're eating and from the gluconeogenesis that goes on all throughout the day. So you never have empty glu uh, glycogen stores. You might have low glycogen stores, but we always have some glycogen in, in, in our bodies. Um, so that's not a, a, a problem that the, first, the athlete who works out has to face because we have, number one, a high protein requirement, so the body's going to use that protein anyway. And secondly, we're giving the body a fuel source to use so that it doesn't have a need to convert the protein into glucose. And that's where people go wrong. Now, if you're a couch potato, you don't do anything all day long, okay, y y you might benefit better from less protein because you don't really need the protein to repair anything aside from the, glute, the enzymes, the hair, nail, skin, and all that normal stuff that gets replaced. But you don't have the, the, the skeletal muscle being broken down uh, to the degree that someone like yourself or myself or a bodybuilder would do. So, Dave, what, what body weight are you walking around at right now? Uh, less than you. <laughs> I'm about 195 right now. You just had a shoulder replacement, right? Yes. Yeah. I was about 210 before that, and you know, I, I couldn't train for eight weeks, so I, I, I lose – I cannibalize muscle really quickly if I don't work out or anything like that. And But you know what? I really – I felt comfortable around 200, 210. My blood pressure is good. I don't really think – I don't want to be bigger than that. That's why I really restrict my food intake because – I grow, you know, I'll put the muscle back on fast. You know, that muscle memory, you know, comes back pretty quickly. But you're spending a lot of time cycling. What are you doing with respect to your weight workouts? Before I got the shoulder surgery, I was, my weight training had really been restricted quite a bit because of the pain level I was in. Everything upper body wise hurt, you know. So I was doing machines and hammer strength stuff and cables to try to work around the pain. But I, to quite frankly, everything I did hurt. So that's why I got to the point where I was just like, you know what, enough of this. Let me get the shoulder done. I'm going to get the other one done at the end, probably next summer. And at least I could work out again because I enjoy training. You know, it's, it, it's a different story. Some guys just don't like working out. I actually like working out, you know. So I want to go back to the gym. But I don't – I'm not doing it to be huge anymore. It, that, that doesn't serve me anymore. But but I want to be able to do it, you know, and the activity. Because, you know, like you said, you mentioned something very, very prudent earlier today. You said when you ate the Jimmy Jean sausages and the butter, you felt crappy. Your body knows what good food is. It knows what junk food is. People ask me all the time, they're like, why don't you eat cakes or cookies? You've got a great metabolism. You could burn that stuff up. I say, you know what? I don't feel good. I'm not productive. I, I, I can't sit in front of a computer and work for 10 hours like I do now. I like to feel good. So to me, I'd rather eat more good food 
because my body knows it's the right thing to put into it. Yeah, and basically in asking that question, I want to know what your activity level was. I knew you had the shoulder surgery, but yeah. what was are both of the shoulders just a result of all the heavy training over all the years? Probably. You know, I, I am very flexible for a bodybuilder. Like, I mean, like crazy, you know, splits and stuff like that without even trying. I think that that's very functional as an athlete, but I think as a bodybuilder who's trying to push ridiculously maximum weights, what happens is your joints kind of grind a little bit because there's too much movement in there. And so while you don't really tear muscles when you have loose joints, you, you wear your joints away. Guys who have tight joints never have joint problems, but then they wind up snapping muscles in the gym. You know what I mean? Because something's got to give, you know, at, at some point. And I just... You know, got unlucky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and in watching some of your videos, I know uh, it was uh, a day in the life of uh, Dave Palumbo, and I want to talk about your move to Florida and uh, yeah, yeah, the snakes. Sure. There's a lot of great interest that I, I didn't know you had, but yeah. uh, I was watching you. Your one, one of your favorite restaurants, and you had a bowl full of rice. And I'm thinking, hmm, that's counterintuitive to everything that I've talked to Dave about yeah. because he's almost, you know, he's the keto guy. Yeah. So you're walking around between a buck ninety, two hundred. Mm-hmm. Uh, and you're not a calorie counter. You you like no. to go by proteins and fats. So yeah. just as a person who's walking at a buck ninety range, what are mm. you taking in every single day, give or take? Because I'm a, I'm a guy that measures. Yeah. People that people right. that talk to me and they want to throw numbers at me. If they're not giving me numbers, I'm not buying what they're saying. <laughs> I you know the first thing I look for when I go to a restaurant is protein. Obviously, that's the first thing. Then I look for fats. So. I'm looking for what's my protein source, what's my fat source, you know, um, and then I and then I car- the rest of it's carbs. So it depends on how I feel. I'm like I said, I have a very good metabolism. So to me, for health purposes, protein and fat is number one, and then the carbs are kind of just the additional stuff. Uh, I like rice. I, my body metabolizes it really easy. It doesn't sit in my, lay in my stomach for a long period of time, uh, like some of the other carbs, like pastas, tend to be a little heavier, you know. So to me, I look for things that digest quickly. Like just for instance, for lunch today, I had I had a, a piece of salmon. I had some brown rice. I mix in some uh, some frozen mixed vegetables in there. I, I cook the rice with the vegetables together. I rip apart some some br- raw broccoli and kale. I put it on top. I mix everything together. I put about two tablespoons of macadamia nut oil, the, the brand that I make, the species nutrition brand, and I put some salt and pepper on it, and that's my meal. That's a great meal for me. It's high protein. It's got good moderate fats. Oh, and I'll cut, cut up half an avocado in there. So I got the avocado. I got the mac oil for the fats in there. The salmon has a little fat, obviously, in there. I got my fiber from my, you know, my vegetables, and I have, you know, I'm using brown rice, which has fiber in it. And probably my rice, I'm probably only eating about, you know, 50 grams, 40, 50 grams of carbs, which is not a lot for someone like me, you know, and, but I'm eating a lot of protein. I'm eating a lot of fats, you know, in the diet that I shot you that I'd come up with, man, I had my drink every single night and that was cutting down for me because, yeah. you know, make no mistake about it. Everybody knows, uh, through my past and WWF is stone cold, Steve Austin. I was a guy <laughs> that drank a lot of beer and that was, uh, that was not uh, something we just did on TV. That was when what I was, I drank a lot. <laughs> And trying to get back in shape or trying to, to get in the best shape I could, uh, I sent you my diet. Uh, yeah. You said, hey, man, let's eliminate the alcohol for the next seven weeks and get on this thing and see what we can do. Talk to me or and, and more importantly, my listeners, because I've learned yeah. in doing this. When I set my mind to doing something, that was one of the things that was cool about hiring you. Uh, as a coach, I mean, you have to be, hey, first and foremost, I got to be accountable to myself. But if mm-hmm. I have a guy uh, with a track record with knowledge and I'm paying for that knowledge, you know, I need to do my part. If he's telling me to do uh, 45 minutes of cardio, which is what we started off doing, yeah. I'm doing that. We're hitting everybody part once a week. And this is exactly what I'm eating 100% to a T. I can't throw that four ounces of bourbon on there every single night. No. So, uh, with respect to alcohol, I know it jumps uh, first in queue in line to be burned off because uh, the body treats it as a poison. It must be eliminated before you can continue to burn fat. But just from, from your standpoint, were you ever in your life a drinker or were you just always into the bodybuilding lifestyle? When I was bodybuilding, 100%, I didn't do any recreational drugs. That, that you know, any kind of alcohol or, or anything like that because it would – my dad was beat into my head – Literally, when I was a kid, as an, if you're an athlete, athletes don't drink. And if you want to be the best, if you want to leave the door open, let someone pass you because you're you you got to drink some beers or you got to go drink whatever hard alcohol. You're a fool, he said. So don't waste your time. So I, that always stuck in my head. And you know, 
it's interesting what you said about the alcohol. Alcohol gets metabolized by the liver, but the caloric load from it still gets have to be still has to be dealt with. And people think, well, alcohol is metabolized differently. Alcohol is almost as many calories per gram as fat. It's seven calories per gram. The problem is that they're empty calories. They can't be used for fuel. So your body just stores them. You know, yeah, most people, if you have a fast metabolism, you can store them and then burn them. But it's it's definitely short circuiting your fat burning in your body because here you are, you're storing these the alcohol calories, and you're going to use, then you got to burn those up before you actually get into getting back to burning stored body fat. So you're going to bed at night hoping you're going to burn. I'm hoping you're going to burn fat, and you're storing calories because you're drinking right. this bourbon. You know, you're actually turning off the fat burning machinery at night. You know. Which one obviously of, is going to inhibit your your you know your weight loss. One of the things in uh in working with you uh, versus working with myself, man, <laughs> because I I have the uh, the propensity to get on the internet and read every single diet that everybody's been on, <laughs> and so I would just jump from the eating program to eating program, and you know thinking that I knew it all, and and god dang, I was working my ass off, and then on top of you know having a few drinks, I was getting nowhere. And so in, in working with you, we, I started this program, give or take, on June 20th of 2017. And I had whittled myself down with my system down to a, a real badly composed 258 pounds. And I think at the lowest I got down to was 241.3. Uh, this morning I weighed in, sent you a picture, I was at 242. And I was pretty much just kind of maintaining my weight right now. But, and one of the things we did uh, after I started the initial eating program, I was doing my due diligence, uh, but we stayed at the same body weight. And then so I sent you the results, sent you the pictures. We dropped out an ounce of protein at each meal. And then that's when things started coming off. That's when things started happening. So with respect to the regular everyday person out there that's going to try to go down the road I went on that jumps all over the place. Speak to how you, as you told me, like to only change one thing in the diet at a time so that you can maintain consistency or what the result is going to be before you make the next change because your changes are so minimal. I was like, man, is this... This guy's crazy. <laughs> um, but the proof is in the pudding. Uh, I lost, uh, what, 16, 17 pounds and a lot of, a lot of body fat and my shorts barely fit. So talk to me about just how you go about making the small changes in the diet, Dave, because I know many people do exactly what I do looking for an instant result. Yeah. I think the biggest mistake, Steve, that people make is that they don't treat diets like a science. I mean, if you're going to build a bathroom, you're not going to just go watch everything on the internet and start doing 40 different ways. You, you, you got to have an, a plan. You got to have a, a blueprint of what you're going to do. And I have in my head the blueprint of how to get people in shape. And I, and I teach this to people. I have a course called The Secrets of Becoming a Diet Guru. Of course, I teach people how to, how to become coaches for, for dieting. I do plenty of YouTube videos explaining stuff about diet. The science of dieting does not change. What I'm teaching is, 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 is an, it's not an if, or, and it's the definitive science of what's going on. The problem with, with bodybuilders is that bodybuilders are very genetically gifted, especially at the upper level. These guys can do anything and lose weight. And so most people watch these guys and they try to emulate it and they fail. And they're like, I don't understand why it's not working. Because you've got to have the science down because for 99% of the population, it's not going to work. And that's what you were trying to do is follow all these bodybuilder diets, but these guys don't even know why it's working. They can't they, – right. they, they're just lucky because they have such a good metabolism. They can eat anything they want, and as long as it's structured, they get in shape. So I created a diet you know, with, with rules based on the science of what's going on. And obviously, I, I, what I try to do is give people a little more than they need, you know, a little more food, a little more leeway so that I can start making changes when things don't work. And like you said – like a scientist, if, if I change more than one variable at a time, then, then how do I know what's working and not working? So what I do is I'll add cardio or I'll change the food intake or I'll add a fat burner. You can't do more than one thing at a time or you don't know what's, what's going on and, and then I'm not doing my job. I want to have complete control over everything that's going on in your body as your coach so that if something does go wrong, I know how to fix it. A lot of guys take, you know, look, I, I can't tell you how many guys have come to me and said, Dave, can I, can I, can you help me? I'm like, well, let me see what you've been doing. And they send me a, 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 an email and I'm looking at the very diet that I wrote. It's exactly word for word punctuation the same. Someone just took my diet, pasted it into an email and, and was charging this guy for it. The problem was he didn't know how to manipulate it because he didn't understand the science of this guy. So now this guy comes to me and I'm like, you know what? I got to be honest with you. I'm going to help you, but I'm going to give you the same diet. I'm just going to 
my coaching skill comes in how I alter the diet, how I tweak the variables, because that's how you're going to get Im improvements, you know. But it's funny because uh, I saw that very same diet that you're speaking of. They have a 200 pound version, they got the 250 <laughs> pound version. I'm like, hey, man, yeah. you know, because I saw, but I said, I ain't following that. I'm going to go to the man himself and see what he <laughs> makes for me. W was it in the same ballpark? Well, yeah, it was in the same ballpark, yeah. but everybody's different. And, and as someone who has looked at, uh, you know, dare say 20 diets, and tried to follow them ver verbatim, speaking for myself. I've done that. Any diet, just because you weigh the same as somebody else, might it get you results? It might. <laughs> but th think very hard and fast before you decide just to arbitrarily go down that road because it, it, it might not do a damn thing for you. You have to have a game plan. And I, you know, I'm not the only coach out there who can get people in shape, but there's got to be a game plan. I, but there's a lot of people like yourself out there that are very scientifically uh, motivated. In other words, if you know the science and why you're doing what you're doing, you feel much more comfortable doing it because you understand the logic behind it. Some people don't care. Some people listen to anything you tell them to do. They, they don't even want to know. Ronnie Coleman, when Chad Nichols helped Ronnie Coleman win eight Olympias, I, if you ask Ronnie to this day, he probably doesn't even know what he was doing. He was just listening to whatever you know piece of paper arrived in the mail, and he followed it. But you know, the people that Ask the questions. And I always encourage my clients, ask questions. Ask me why. If your coach can't tell you why you're doing something, guess what? It's probably not a good idea to listen to him. Uh, I say ask me why because I want to explain it to you because if you understand why you're doing it, you're going to feel way more comfortable and it's going to give you the confidence to do the diet uh, and move forward knowing that I, I – I have a, a game plan behind it. All right, I'm take a pause in this conversation with Dave Palumbo and get back to our discussion. First, I got to give big ups to True Car. When you're looking to buy a car, it's important you're getting real pricing on actual inventory. Often enough, this is not the case as people configure cars online only later to find out they're not available. But with True Car, you get real pricing on actual inventory. This is not pricing from True Car, but from an actual dealer, and even more so, a local certified dealer of your choosing that is committed to offering you a competitive market price. True Car users are more likely to enjoy a faster buying process when they connect with True Car certified dealers. There are over 13,000 True Car certified dealers nationwide. When you're ready to buy, visit True Car to enjoy a more confident car buying experience. Some features are not available in all states. And while we're on the subject of cars, let's figure out how you can save hundreds of dollars on car insurance for that vehicle. All you have to do is go to GuyCode.com, and in 15 minutes, you could be saving 15% or more on car insurance. You can finish listening to this podcast, and immediately after, go to GuyCode.com and get yourself set up. Extra money in your pocket? It just may be the most rewarding thing you do today. Daddy, where do babies come from? Uh... Well, uh... Honey? Mommy went to the store. Oh, well, you see, um... Well, there's a mommy and a daddy, right? Right. And see, when they call Geico, uh, they could save a bunch of money on car insurance. Oh, really? And that makes them happy? Yes, that makes them very happy. That's good. Yeah. Well, I'm glad we could have this talk, sunshine. <laughs> Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. Podcast One Sports presents Attack Each Day, the Harbaugh's podcast. Every Tuesday, you can hear Jack Harbaugh. We're going to attack this day with an enthusiasm unknown to mankind. Jim Harbaugh. What the hell's going on around here? And JT Rogan share their stories from on and off the field. Past guests include John Harbaugh, ESPN's Adam Schefter, and Pardon My Takes, PFT, and Big Cat. So don't miss an episode of Attack Each Day, the Harbaugh's podcast. Every Tuesday, exclusive exclusively on podcast1.com and the new podcast1 app just a sample of what's coming to podcast1 sports the steve austin show the steve austin show hey let's talk about going into uh, the keto diet just for a, a little bit because as you mentioned or alluded to earlier in the podcast hey once you first start dropping out those carbs you're going to get the keto flu and you're just going tired, run down. You might have a runny nose. Man, I got the keto flu. And then on top of that, about two weeks later, I actually got the flu. And I'm, I'm one of those kind of people that does not get sick at okay. all. And it knocked me on my ass. I was sitting there thinking, holy smokes, it's about two weeks worth of flu. Mm -hmm. So I got the keto flu. And then, you know, I'd been kind of experimenting with my version of the standard keto diet. So I kind of dropped out, you know, my, my uh, glycogen reserves. So I'd kind of lost the water weight prior to you. Once we started this process, you know, at the 258 mark, 
uh, we set the cardio at 45 minutes uh, a day, and then we adjusted it accordingly. And so, uh, like I said, at, from uh, 258 to a low of 241, 17 pounds, with those things to be expected, the keto flu, feel a little bit tired, and, and then you, you get clear-headed. You, you know, when I was eating you know, all the carbs that I was, because back in the day I would have a, a buddy of mine who was making my diets, and he would say, Steve, I was eating 300 grams of carbs. He goes, your carbs ain't high enough, your carbs ain't high enough. And I'm thinking, <laughs> man, you sure about this? And this was a guy that kind of knew his stuff. And uh, yeah. so I started jumping my carbs up, and I started getting heavier. But anyway, going back into this, this keto diet, I got the keto flu, went through that easy thing. Then once I normaled out and, and leveled, you know, everything in the brain, for, for my brain, being hit in the head with as many steel chairs as I can, pretty damn smooth <laughs> energy flow and pretty good thought process through the way. So once you first get through those first steps of the keto process, what kind of weight is acceptable or is, is a good rate on a weekly right. basis? Because I would send you those pictures every three, yeah. five to seven days, and we'd monitor my progress. But w w what is ideally something you like to shoot for as a coach? Uh, yeah, for I, a normal I, human being, say a 20% body fat, just yeah. so because a person who's obese is going to have a much higher poundage to lose. Sure. Most people who start on a ketogenic diet lose a lot of weight quickly the first two weeks. You didn't because you were already on a ketogenic diet. So we didn't see that water weight loss because that's just water weight that's in the muscles as glycogen. So as the glycogen depletes down, you lose a lot of fluid. So a lot of guys I start working with bodybuilder-wise, they lose like 20 pounds the first two weeks. They flip out you know, because they, they think they're losing muscle, but it's just water weight. Then that slows down. For the normal person, they'll lose like anywhere from like four to 12 pounds the first two weeks. Once that's gone, okay, and, and the glycogen's depleted, then we're looking at one to three pounds a week. Okay, if you lose, usually two pounds is ideal. If you lose three, it's a miracle. Sometimes you get a fourth pound in there. I think that has to do with water. If you're losing one, that's acceptable. If you're losing nothing, then I have to I have to start analyzing what's going on and do we need to make changes. So any, like I said, one to three pounds seems to be the ideal amount of weight to lose per week. And you know, I'm not a calorie person to figure out, but that's you know that that's usually the way it goes with every diet. They always say two pounds a week is kind of like ideal for a person to metabolize. There were a couple of bumps along the way. Uh, I think probably. Twice I went off the reservation and on a late night just raided every single thing in the kitchen. <laughs> uh, but, but after I did that, I had to get back on my horse and say, hey, man, I'm reporting to Dave. i got to send yeah. his ass some pictures, and I need uh -huh. to get, you know, get on my game plan. But, but two times I did go off the reservation. Uh -huh. um, we, had, we had some problems there. I was out filming a bro Broken Skull Challenge, and I was talking to you. I got a little frustrated during the process yeah. because I started holding water. And the the scale wouldn't move, and I was sending you the pictures about every five days, so you could you know judge my progress. And it came down to I guess what we came up with was one being in the sun all day long, getting burnt makes you hold water. Yeah. Also, being on your feet all day long can cause edema or holding a little water, you know, in, in your extremities, your lower extremities, particularly legs, ankles, which I was from being on my feet and on my legs all day and out in the sun. So it frustrated me, though, because I knew I was doing everything right, but the scale wasn't moving. Mm. Yeah. I mean, there are definitely people who I help a lot of bodybuilders, and when they get to really low body fat at the end, and they're doing a lot of cardio and taking a lot of you know fat burners, they have trouble sleeping. And if you don't get enough sleep, your cortisol levels really go up. It's a stress hormone. That's what's released during stress. And when you're on your feet all day, or you're working, you know, you're working at you know uh, on the set of a of a TV show all day, very stressful because you don't even realize that you're under stress because you got to do certain things. You're there. You're not in a comfortable environment. When cortisol goes up, you hold water. I mean, think about it. If you've ever taken a, had to take prednisone for anything, I mean, what's the first thing that happens? You gain weight from it. So, and it's not just water. A lot of times, it's fat gain. So, you, you we don't really want high cortisol levels. That's why um, it's important. And I always tell people not to use a lot of stimulants when you're dieting. Some people have this propensity to take oodles and oodles of caffeine and these pre-workouts and and anything they can get their hands on that will stimulate them. That's not good. That stresses the body out. That causes cortisol output. That will make you retain fluid. It even can, you know, short circuit some of the muscle, you know, 
the, excuse me, the, uh, the fat losses that you have going on. So you got to be careful of cortisol levels. It's important that you get enough sleep. It's important that you take days off from the gym. I know guys that when they start dieting for a show, they want to train every day a week, every day, seven days a week they're in the gym. And, and after a while, they just crash because you got to give your body a chance to recover. And that's one of the biggest things that I also try to control as a coach is how much output a person's giving. Because most people have too much. They want to do too much, and they crash and burn. So I kind of cut them back. When I see, oh, I'm training each body part twice a week, every three days. I, I only take one day a week off. And on that day, I go in and do abs and hamstrings. I'm like, well, then you're not taking a day off. if You, you know what I mean? So I try to and make it uh, people understand that you need to be able to recover. If you don't recover, your body will rebel against you, and it will not allow you to lose fat. So – you didn't do that purposely. It was a it was a it was a situation of circumstance with you because you were working. But I, what I try to do is at least allay the fears in your mind that hey, the diet's not it's not the diet that's not working. It's just it's just the environment you're in. I said let's get through this weekend, like you said, and and then you you went right back on the you know you got right back to losing weight again. Um, having just just to comment on one thing where you said we ate everything in sight. You know if you do that once in a blue moon. Sometimes it could actually function to stimulate metabolism. Obviously, if you do it every night or every other night, it's, it's, you're, gonna, you're not going to lose weight. So. And that was one of the things you, that you uh, had sent me. I mean, due to the fact that I was pretty much 100% spot on, it was the consistency of the proper nutrition program that I was following. And, you know, going back to what you said about, you know, what your father told you, if you want to look like or live like a professional athlete, you need to – eat like one or behave like one uh, with, with respect to giving the Heisman stiff arm to alcohol and whatever. I just got finished talking to an ultra racer, David Clark, and, you know, he was a hell of an alcoholic and just bad off and, and, you know, kicked that demon away and started living like, you know, professional athlete. That's what he turned into. So, you know, I had to stay the course. I had to do things and, and you know, and I had to rationale and then it's the people that listen to my show. As you know, I like to have a drink every now and then again. I, I just had to focus on the task at hand and was that four ounces of bourbon going to take me closer to my goal or further away from it? And it was going to take it further away. So I just completely gave it to Heisman Stiff Arm. Now that I've kind of reached a, a goal weight that I wanted to, uh, to be at for right now, and I think you and I will attempt to go lower maybe in two or three months, you know, I can have my cheat day and I can have my four ounces of bourbon once a week. And that helps me maintain my sanity, stay on the rails, and it works for me. Yeah. So, because at the end of the day, you have to do something. I'm speaking to everybody out there. Not, I'm not speaking to Dave. I'm talking with him, but I'm speaking to everybody out there. You have to do something that is going to work for you and that is sustainable. Because if you're doing something, if you're changing, if you're, if you're making a change that is so radical, you cannot stick with it. You know, you're, it's going to last for as long as you want it to. But if you cannot sustain it, you know, you're just going down a road and pretty soon you're going to get derailed. So what I'm doing works for me. I, I think it's important also, Steve, to, like you said, you, you don't want to live like the life of a monk. You want to be able to enjoy yourself. But I find that if you give yourself a cheat meal once a week, if you give yourself a bourbon night once a week, You'll look for, you'll enjoy it so much more because you're not doing it every, when you do something every day, you take it for granted and you usually t tend to get into abuse as, a, as opposed to just enjoyability. If you do that once a week, you're going to enjoy, you know, your little buzz you get. You're going to, you're going to know tomorrow I'm back on the diet again. I'm, I'm focused because let's face it, at our age, you know, I can say this, we're about the same age. Yeah. You know, it's about you live in a healthy long life now. You know, we, we, we don't want to live a, a sick long life. We want to live a healthy long life. So there has to be some accommodations when you hit over 40 years old that you make that maybe you got away with when you were in your 20s, but you can't do anymore. Well, I'll tell you what, but, you know, back in the day, you know, when I was a professional wrestler, uh, and I consider myself back in those days, Dave, I mean, professional wrestling is a work. We know that, but I consider myself a professional athlete. Mm -hmm. I acted like one. I trained like one. I performed like one. But then I was also a rock star and I acted like one and I performed like one <laughs> and then on the other side that's your truck driver because you're driving yourself all around the country you know trying to get these shots uh, and, and that's all fine and dandy you know when you're when you're young you're bulletproof and you can get away with it you know that that was the lifestyle I was living but to your point you know now at 52 hey man I'm here for the long haul and I feel much better you know having my you know, one to two drinks, you know, once a week. I'm always going to have that. But I feel much better, first of all, physically and mentally. 
And then second of, all, second of all, about myself. So it's been a transition that, you know, I've enjoyed and, you know, really works for me. I wanted to talk to you a few things about what happens or some of the things that go on physiologically from a keto diet because you recommended that I take, uh, I know you have your own brand of supplements, and I want mm, to talk about sure. that through Species Nutrition. Now, when I first got this diet, and you know me, I'm going to be, be very frank with you. I said, okay, here's the diet, and then here's this list of supplements. Okay, the guys are trying to sell me supplements. <laughs> and I'm not a guy who does a whole lot of supplements. But, you know, I, I am going to try your stuff, and I believe in what you're talking about because fiber. Once you stop uh, taking carbs in, all of a sudden, you know, that's a bulking uh, type food. Once you drop all the carbs out of your diet, you don't crap as much. Just, just, <laughs> just, just, just put it out there like, like it is. Yeah. You don't. So all of a sudden, your your, reg, your regular bowel movements aren't your regular bowel movements. So uh, the fiber, I, I definitely agree with. Also, uh, your uh, mineral eyes. Uh, I was taking uh, magnesium and calcium. I was taking magnesium and uh, potassium just as far as my little system that mm-hmm. I put together out of Broken Skull Challenge because I'm out there in the heat sweating all day. Uh, and you have arthralize, you have omega lyse. But talk to me about some of the supplements one might want to consider because I do recommend fiber. I definitely uh, would recommend an electrolyte, um, uh, a mineral, or potassium because I, I believe those from my personal experience. Speak to the, the people about that because in losing the carbohydrates, you're also missing out on a couple of nutrients. Yeah, you know, you don't hold fluid as, as easily when you're on low carbohydrates. So, you know, you mentioned potassium. Believe it or not, sodium becomes way more important. You know, because you, because you don't. Sodium is what makes you hold fluid in your body and enables you to, to to stay hydrated. You're out in the sun. You're on no carbohydrates. You better be taking in sodium and you better be drinking enough fluids. You can't just. And sometimes guys drink so much water they water down their sodium. So they think they're taking enough sodium. And they're really not. So I highly recommend eating a lot of salt in your diet when you're on a ketogenic diet, especially. Uh, because it's very easy to lose fluid. Um, but, you know, there's, there's th- three or four supplements that I, look, I tell people are necessities. Everything else is a luxury item. The necessities are a vitamin and mineral formulation that actually has real amounts of vitamins and has chelated minerals that enable you to absorb them. The reason that this is important is because while the macronutrients in the body, the protein, fats, and carbs are all important, you know, that, so that we get the, the right nutrients in, the Minerals and vitamins are, are what run the chemical reactions in our body. So if you're missing calcium, you're missing iodine, you're missing chromium, you're missing vitamin B, you're not going to be able to, 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 to metabolize fats. You're not going to be able to metabolize carbs. You're not going to be able to you know, synthesize protein. So you need all these. I'll give you an easy for instance. If you don't have... People think that you know you need insulin, okay, to absorb glucose into your blood, into your uh, muscle cells, which is true. But if there's no chromium, which is a, which is a metal, there's no chromium present. Insulin doesn't work. And what happens is your body doesn't know there's not doesn't doesn't know there's no chromium there. It thinks there's not enough insulin there, so it releases extra insulin, and then it, then it makes people get fat. So this is one little instance where if you don't have this one mineral, you're gonna you're gonna have a much higher propensity to to, to a store body fat, okay? And that's just one of a million different you know examples. So a very high quality uh, mineral and vitamin supplements is, is important. That doesn't mean going to the CVS pharmacy and buying Centrum one a day because you can't jam enough of what you need into one pill if you're an athlete, okay? It just doesn't happen. So I created V-Mineralize for myself, basically. I said, I'm going to make what I need, and then if everyone else is smart enough after I educate them, they'll take it too. And, that, and that's that's how Species came about. It wasn't – I did it for me and my clients, basically. I, that's what the line was. And then people just started asking questions and listening to the – you know to the science that I put out there, and they said, hey, I want to get a hold of this too. And so that's how the supplement company came about. That's number one important, most important supplement. Number two, okay, is an essential fatty acid supplement because none of us get the essential fats. And without going into a whole lecture, we're talking the omega-3, you know, fats and the omega-6 fats. And the threes you should always get from an animal source of fat like fish oil, okay, or krill oil or you know, one of those sources of omega threes are better than getting in flaxseed because flaxseed, which is a plant source of omega threes, doesn't convert to usable form in humans efficiently. Uh, likewise, on the omega six side of things, there are two separate omega six f- essential fats. One is we get plenty from our food, which is called arachidonic acid. The other fatty acid, GLA or gamma lamellic acid, is found in very high amounts in evening primrose oil, and that's so I put primrose oil, I put fish oil into that formulation. 
and I put them in the right amounts, three grams of fish oil, 2,600 milligrams of primrose oil, and it's, it's a no-brainer. It's, it's, it's a, an insurance policy that you're not going to hoard fat because your body thinks it's deprived of essential fatty acids. So those two are imperative. Then every, Ameri- every person in the world probably pretty much, unless you're walking around naked outside in the sun on the equator, is deficient in vitamin D. So you should be, even though my V-mineralized formula does have 2,000 units of vitamin D, vitamin D in there, you need an extra 5,000 units. So you should be taking 7,000 IUs of vitamin D3 a day. Those three, imperative, add the fiber as your fourth, and those are your top four supplements every single person should take. Everything above and beyond that is, is luxury item. Whey protein, carb, you know, powder, um, uh, even joint, you know, essential joint replacement repair products are great, but they're not essential, you know, to you living a healthy lifestyle and burning fat and building muscle optimally. The four supplements I mentioned, every person should take every day of their life. And don't just take fiber when you're on a low carb diet, because fiber has so many other, you know, health benefits. Remember, you could only build repair muscle and burn fat as efficiently as you can remove waste from your body. And I give people the analogy of the fish tank. If anyone out there has a fish tank or ever had a goldfish bowl, if you don't clean the water, guess what happens? The fish dies, okay? If you have a fish tank with filters on it, which would be analogous to the kidneys of our body, it still works, but you still got to clean the water because the water builds up toxic waste even with the filter working on it. Same thing with fiber. Fiber is your water changer of your fish tank. You get rid of the stuff that's in there that shouldn't be there, the toxins that have built up, the fiber yanks it out of the body and makes you feel healthier. Hey, you know, going back to the salt comment, and I noticed in some of your videos, very liberal use of salt, and that was one of the things that I enjoyed about a keto diet, was the fact that I can put salt on my food. When when Normally on on one of my older eating programs, taking, you know, 250, 300 grams of carbs, you know, 250 grams of protein, you know, 75 grams of fat, my buddy would always tell me, hey man, too much sodium, lay off sodium. So I'm digging the fact that, that I can enjoy my salt. I noticed that in my diet, Dave, red meat is not a part of my eating program. I have the salmon with the omega-3s. That's that's in one serving a day. And the rest of it, I, I get two protein shakes, and I'm getting 14 ounces of chicken breast. I was thinking when I started this thing, hey, man, chicken thighs are great. You know, this uh, you know this, this hamburger meat is great. Uh, are, are you proposed or against uh, the use of red meat? I'm not. I, I actually think that, like, top round red meat is, is a really healthy cut of meat. Um, if you can get grass-fed beef, even better. Because, you know, grass-fed beef, because the, the, the cattle actually eat grass, um, all the fats in there, or most of the fats in there, become, they're omega-3 fats. You know, the problem, the reason why beef is not healthy for you is because the cows that we produce in this country are fed corn. And corn is not a natural diet for, for, for cows. And cows turn corn into pro-inflammatory omega-6 fatty acids. And that's what causes, you know, problems. And once again, from a, from a, a macronutrient standpoint, I mean, red meat should be as good as as chicken, as good as fish, because it's got if it's got the same fat and the same protein content. Well, why wouldn't it work? Well, it does to a certain degree, but the problem it goes back to what I mentioned about positive partitioning foods and negative partitioning foods. Saturated fats don't tend to stimulate the metabolic rate in the body. The saturated fats don't instruct the muscle cells to build muscle and use stored body fat, whereas essential fatty acids really do that. And because essential fatty acids and the heart healthy uh, fatty acids like the monounsaturated fats like olive oil and macadamia oil, these are actually doing something in the body. They're being used for rebuilding the cells. Um, you know, saturated fat to a certain degree, but it's not good in excess. So if you told me, hey, Dave, can I have red meat every other day, one meal a day, and I'm going to eat like top round or filet cut, I'd be like, absolutely have it. But we do find that people lose weight better on fish, okay, as opposed to chicken and red meat. Because fish has a lot more omega-3 fats, and omega-3 fats sensitize the cells to insulin, meaning that you will release less insulin to get the job done of lowering blood sugar. Obviously, insulin is a fat storage hormone. We want insulin levels as low as possible. So fish definitely works to burn fat better in the body than the, uh, than the red meat and, and chicken sources. And if you ask any bodybuilder the last couple of weeks when, they, when they're really trying to lean out, 
what do they do? They go to all fish, you know. Hey, one of the things, uh, you know, that in starting the diet and talking to different people about the ketogenic diets, they'd tell me, you know, about eating uh, the bacon or the Jimmy Dean sausage, and they would say, versus your, you know, you, you had me on macadamia nuts, almonds, uh, th- those kind of fat sources, peanut butter. And people would tell me, hey, man, body, your, your body don't know where the fat comes from, you know, and fat's fat. Is fat fat? No, well, we know that. That's not the case because there's different types of fats. There's essential fatty acids. There's monounsaturated fats and then Jimmy Dean fat, which we don't even know what we don't even know really what's in there. I mean, when you think about it, how could you even, you know, if you're, you know, if you're if you're driving around in a Ferrari, all right, and you go to the gas station because you're running low on gas, so you could have put the high test gas in there. You could have put the the regular, you know, in there. A hundred percent. I'm going with the best stuff I got. Yeah, and it's not because you know you you, you know because you're jerking your chain. The stuff makes the, the the engine you know more efficient. It makes it produce more horsepower. Uh, less, you know, engine knock because it burns cleaner. It's the same thing with foods. If you eat clean foods, you eat foods that, that, that are not man-made. You know, Jacqueline always said it, if man didn't make it, don't eat it, that type of thing. It's true. I mean, the stuff that's, that, that's natural is going to be, you know, assimilated by the body better. It has better, and I hate to say, I hate to go into a whole energy conversation, but it has better energy. You know, the energy of the universe is in there as opposed to the energy of the of the chemicals that we're putting into our bodies, you know? One of the things you never uh, uh, approached me about or really told me about, well, you, you told me to consume plenty of uh, water, but uh, where are you on the water factor? A lot of people tell you, hey, gallon a day. There's other people, mm-hmm. two gallons a day. Where are you with that? The wonderful thing about the human body is it lets you know everything you need. If you're thirsty, drink. If you're not thirsty, don't overdrink. Because once again, if your body's saying you're not thirsty right now, and I'm not talking about where you, you're working so much that you just forgot to drink. I'm talking about you're just hanging around and you don't really feel thirsty. If you're over drinking and just pouring water down thinking you're going to burn fat, you're, you're nuts. If anything, you're just going to water down your electrolytes. So, um, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of kidney doctors and stuff like that over the years because I have a lot of guys I work with that have kidney disease. And they're like, the worst thing for people with kidney disease is to over drink because it taxes the kidneys. It makes them work harder to have to constantly be filtering all this extra fluid. So I think drink when you're thirsty. Is it probably when you're dieting, I'm sure most people will get at least a gallon in a day. I, it's almost impossible not to because you're going to drink more fluids when you're not eating as much food as you want. That's just the case. I find I drink less fluids when I'm eating whatever I want. Uh, when I'm dieting, I definitely drink more more fluids. I don't think there's any reason to be drinking three gallons a day. When I see those guys walking around with that jug, I, I cringe, you know, because they think that because people really think that the water burns fat. They do. I talk to people. They they're like, don't I need this water to to, to maximize my fat burning? I'm like, no. You know, <laughs> you should be hydrated, but you don't need to be right. super hydrated. Is what I'm saying. All right, let, let's talk about cardio real quick uh, because I had a, the eating program. I was doing my weights, and all of a sudden, cardio uh, because you you've got the we we don't need to go all day on this, but you have fasted cardio, you have cardio after you worked out, or a separate yeah. session of cardio. Where where do you stand on that? Because you never ever want you never once told me, Dave, Steve, I want you to get up at six a.m. and do fasted cardio. You didn't say that. So wh- what's your stance? There's two ways to I, – I always say do cardio in a depleted state. That means first thing in the morning is, is most efficient or after you weight train because you've, you've depleted your body. So oh. those, two, those two times are the most efficient times to do it. That doesn't mean that if you have a very busy schedule and you got to – in between shifts at the, at the hospital, you got to jump in on a, on a treadmill in the, in, the, in the workout room and do it in the middle of the day, it'll still work. But the most efficient times to burn fat would be first thing in the morning or after you weight train. And that also doesn't mean you should be drinking branched-chain amino acids while you're doing it because then you're going to use the branched-chain amino acids for, for fuel. So you want to be in a depleted state for certain. And we were sticking pretty much with a steady state towards the end, you know, just wanted to try some different things out because I was out there filming my show. I'm training with these – I'm out there with these high-level athletes. I mean, it was just supreme crossfitters, Spartan racers, obstacle course racers. Start throwing in a little high-intensity interval training, which worked. Uh, so mm-hmm. where are you as far as steady state? Because these days – of times I'll see some of the pro bodybuilders out there and they're talking about HIIT and I ain't never seen a bodybuilder do HIIT in my life. I know Stan Efferding says he does run up steps <laughs> and stuff like that, but most time it's steady state and the guys are just putting the time in. And there's also a lot of other things going on with respect to fat burning. So as far as a regular human being, steady state, high intensity, uh, crazy heartbeat, where are you at on that? I always tell people um, at what heart rate do you start burning fat? I ask these people when I do seminars. Who knows? 
everyone raises their hand, giving me different heart rates. You're always burning fat. You just sitting, me and you talking together, we're burning fat. That's what your body will use preferentially. It's when does your body stop burning fat because it can't generate ATP or energy quick enough from burning fat. Um, and that's when you're doing higher intensity activities. Weight training happens to be one of them, but that weight training is a very short start and stop type of thing. But if you were to go on a stepper, step mill, and I said, let's pick up this pace, and you start moving and breathing real hard, you're going to hit a heart rate probably around 130 beats a minute for your, your age where you're going to start switching your metabolism from burning fat, stored body fat, to be burning carbohydrates. And in the absence of carbohydrates in your diet, okay, and that, that doesn't mean if you're eating carbohydrates you know, in your diet, but you're doing fasted cardio in the morning and you're doing you know, high-intensity type training – there's no glucose around. So what's your body going to do? It's going to break down muscle and, and it's going to take those amino acids and convert them into glucose so that you have a fuel source because your body can't generate ATP quick enough from fat metabolism. Okay, So as a bodybuilder or as a, a physique athlete who's trying to preserve muscle and maximize fat burning, why would you want to go high intensity? Okay, Even though it might burn more calories, you're burning the wrong calories. Now, you might have an afterburn effect, metabolic afterburn effect, like, you know, from, from that high intensity cardio, but while you're doing it, you're jeopardizing losing muscle and you're not even burning stored body fat. So to me, it's absolutely ludicrous as a physique athlete. I'm not talking about a guy trying to get in cardiovascular shape. As a physique athlete who wants to lose body fat, it's silly to do high intensity cardio. Copy. Hey, in, uh, in doing this program with you, and we're continuing to work together, you know, I sent you pictures, three, right. five, seven days. You'd tell me when to do a check-in, and I'd send you a picture. Uh, as a few tips to people that are listening to this podcast, talk about the importance of taking pictures, because I can speak for myself to tell the people that are listening to this podcast, it's very easy for me to become body dysmorphic. Uh, my wife can say, hey, you're really looking good. Last night, she said, hey, man, your, your, your vascularity is kind of through the roof today. I was bending down picking something up the forearm was popping and but just speak to the importance of, of taking pictures uh, one at least every week from a starting standpoint and through the process because your eyes will deceive you and that scale will lie to you as far as composition <laughs> well yeah I, especially with women women don't like to take pictures when they're out of shape and i'm like look you must take a start picture for me because I know in six weeks when you're crying to me that you're not losing weight, I'm going to make you go back and look at those pictures and compare them to today's pictures, and you're going to be like, oh, my God, I didn't realize it. And by the way, I want to just say something to all your listeners out there. Stone Cold Steve Austin has a six-pack. And it's pretty damn good right now. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you, you know, I, I could see a picture, and, I, and w w with a picture of myself, I could be pretty objective. But through that that trained eye, that experienced eye that you possess, I mean, you can say, hey, man, you're, you're, you're looking a lot harder or you, a little grainier or, or just however you would define it. It's, it's different through the eyes of someone yeah. you know, other than yourself. Well, you know, this girl um, – who well, I'm doing her diet. I'm not going to say who she is. She, um, she kept saying to me, you know, I know you're seeing my pictures. I'm way harder in person. I want to come see you. I said, okay, come see me. So she came and saw me the other day, and she took off her stuff, and she looked exactly to me like she did in the pictures. Um, but I knew what she was talking about, but I, I can see what pictures do to people. You don't look the same in pictures, but you can see the differences right. in pictures. So I could see when you first started sending me pictures, as you started losing weight, you started getting the, the middle of your abs in, but yet your sides were still hanging with some fat and, and your lower back had – then you weren't sending me lower back pictures. I said, can you send me a picture from behind? And then we had a little fat there. I said, well, that's going to be the last to go. And, and progressively, it just got little, less and less and less. And I know the, how a person looks in a picture versus in person. The, 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 the importance is to see the progression. That's why I tell people it doesn't matter if your scale is accurate or not as long as you're using the same scale. The pictures were uh, extremely important as far as a, a, a tool to help me. Dave, I underwent this eating program that you made out for me. Uh, originally, I thought maybe I would want to get down to 235. Once I got down to 241, I figured, you know, with close to 20 pounds lost, I figured, and, well, and actually, you know, I'd lost weight prior to that before I started working with you with my bullshit and keto diet and hit a brick wall. But nonetheless, you know, from, uh, I guess back in, uh, sometime last year, I was in Colorado. I was doing a podcast with, uh, Triple H in Denver and he flew me in 
And Vince McMahon said to me, I was weighing about 275, and face was bloated, you know, a lot of whiskey. <laughs> I was eating everything under the sun. He goes, God dang, Steve, because, you know, Vince is a health fanatic. Of course. And every time I used to wrestle him, you know, he was always in better shape than I was. And I was like, God <laughs> dang, <laughs> this guy is 20 years older than me, and he's smoking me. And I love that about Vince because he's so dedicated to his workout routine and what he puts in his body. But I was weighing, weighing 275, and so got down to 241. And so if we continue, you know, like uh, I told you, okay, I'm kind of where I want to be, Dave. And we started adding in some carbohydrates. We're adding in about 112 carbs. That, that's what it calculates out to about every other day. And I actually kept losing weight. And you said, hey, man, your, your metabolism spinning up. If I wanted to go to the next level, uh, just from what I've uh, taken in right now, you guys kind of heard my numbers uh, earlier in the podcast. Where would we go from here? Because... As many times throughout the course of this diet, I thought we would uh, take more calories out. Other than the one ounce of protein that we took out of each meal that one time, we never dropped or made any other modifications to the diet, and yet I continued to drop weight. So what would be the next step if I wanted to get down to 235? You know, I, I like to change. Food is the last thing I change. That's usually the last variable I change because – when I figure out what your body requires, you know, from a protein and fat standpoint, that really shouldn't change. However, as you lose weight, you don't have as much body to to, to feed, so to speak. So your 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 pro, your food will eventually decrease a little bit. Um, to get you lower, you know, it depends on you know how your body responds. I don't have a specific like this is how we're going to do it, but. You know, I've with bodybuilders who I want to get down to like really single digit, really low body fat. I might even pull the fats every other day from them and give them more of a vegetable type of a, you know, load them up with more vegetables so they have some volume there to make them feel full. But their caloric, you know, intake for those days would be a lot lower. The good thing about fats is you can do that because your body can store fat. You can't cut protein down really too much because there's no storage facility for protein in the body. You don't eat protein, you're going to lose muscle. You know, you need the protein somewhere. Fats do get stored. Even the essential fatty acids get stored. So, you know, that's one tool that I've used in the past. You know, with some guys, I'll, I'll change the diet. I'll, they won't eat protein fat every day. They'll go every other day or something like that. Just for short periods of time to really push that last bit of fat off the person's body. I might go more cardio. I, look, I've given guys two hours of cardio a day. It sucks, but it does work, you know. So it, it really depends on, you know, who the person is, what their schedule is, you know, what their time frame is to lose it. If you say to me, hey, you know what, when we go back on this diet again, you know, we could, we could take 20 weeks to do it. I don't care. You know, as long as I, I'd rather do it slowly and be able to eat more food, that's easy. If you said to me, I got six weeks, I got a program, I want to lose 10 pounds, I'm like, well, we're going to have to really, you know, then I'm going to make you suffer more. So it depends on what the goals are and what the time frames are. All right. Hey, and, uh, and wrapping up, just uh, on the diet aspect of this, you, you got to have a game plan, right? Yes. You, it's got to be a good game plan because your macros or your nutrition has to be correct. One of the things you said was key was consistency you have to do this every single day man if, if i'd have, if i'd have took your program and used it three days a week and done whatever the hell i wanted to for the other four days i'd been pissing in the wind and that ain't you know i'm i'm i didn't i didn't come to you and say hey man i, I need some help so i could go screw off and not get results that's yeah. on me so i mean you've got to be consistent and, and that's one of the keys which i totally understand and and, and one of the things that you preach Anything else with respect to a person that would, that would want to lose weight and, and start a, a keto type program? Or would you recommend a keto program arbitrarily to anybody out there? Or would you see, use a different route? For a, per, a normal guy who's, who wants, or girl who wants to lose, first of all, all women I put on ketogenic diets. I never give them carbs. Very few women can burn carbs very efficiently. Most of them are terrible carb burns. And women like ketogenic diets because they don't feel bloated at all. And that, that's, sometimes you're, you know, appealing to what people want in their mind is, is more important. But the number one reason people fail on diets, why? Is they cheat. And why do they cheat? Well, it's not necessarily a lack of willpower. It's because they're hungry, they're moody, their blood sugar's low, they have stress in their life. Because let's face it, life still goes on even when you're dieting. Right. So if you could reduce all those variables, get rid of the stress, I mean, excuse me, get rid of the cravings, get rid of the low blood sugars, get rid of the that unbalanced feeling 
you're only feeling good when you're eating, and when you're not eating, you feel like you want to kill someone. You get rid of that, people are going to, are going to succeed on the diet. That's what the ketogenic diet does because when you take your brain off of glucose, off of blood sugar, blood sugar levels remain stable all the time. And you have an unlimited fuel source for the brain because think about how much fat you got in your body. So it's the ideal diet for a person who doesn't do well on diets because they, they because of all those things I just mentioned. Um, it removes those variables. And that's why people will succeed on that type of a diet more so than on a conventional carb diet because of the fact that they feel good. You know, the other mistake people make is also they miss meals. If you miss meals, you can rationalize eating anything. Believe me, I've gone without two meals. I'm driving around. I will stop anywhere and eat because I deserve it, right? You deserve it. You miss two meals, man. At McDonald's, I deserve it. So don't miss meals, number one. And you got to put people on a diet that's going to make them feel good because if they feel good and they don't feel like cheating, they're going to have much better success. And that's why this diet works so well. And one of the things that's been uh, easy for me on your keto program, maybe maybe for any, but I'll tell you what, man, when I got my protein shakes with my peanut butter in them, they're ready to go. My breakfast is always the same, four eggs, six egg whites. I'm done. I'll put a lot of vegetables in there, uh, saute that up. And then those other two chicken meals. I mean, that, that's that's a chicken and literally a handful of macadamia nuts. I mean, boom, I'm done. I could throw some spinach in there to round things out. But the, the thing about it is, and you think back to me and my bachelor days, just as a caveman, you know, the way I would eat, you know, to throw, throw a, you know, a steak on a grill and just have a baked potato. I mean, it, it was a two-course meal. So with this thing, it's sustainable for me because it's so damn easy to follow. Uh, it's, it's not a million different ingredients, and I'm one of those guys, and I know there are a lot of people out there just like me. Some people are different. They can't eat the same thing every single day. I can. Now, every now and then, I like a little variety, and I'll put that in there. But by and large, for the most part, if I'm on a mission, and my goal is to get down to 241, and I've got to eat the same thing every, every single day. First of all, I enjoy chicken. I got a, a pellet grill, which greatly enhances the flavor. I highly recommend it. I love salmon. I love smoking the salmon on that damn grill. But it's just an easy diet to follow. And you know a lot of the guys in WWE who are on the road, and some of your oh, buddies yeah. who are on the road, yeah. it's easy to be on a keto diet, walk into any Denny's Waffle House or IHOP <laughs> and, and eat a proper meal. You're right. Well, you know, it's funny because you mentioned that because, as you know, Paul, Triple H, you know, um, has a very fast metabolism, especially when his body gets going. And he gets mad when I when I make him eat carbs because he's like, man, it's so much. E Can I just stay on the ketogenic diet? It's so much easier when I travel. I said, you're disappearing. You, 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 I got to slow you down a little bit. But it's true. He says when he's on a plane, there's nothing easier than having the shakes, the nuts present, jar of peanut butter. He's like, it's a no-brainer. Anywhere I go, I can get a chicken breast, I can get a piece of steak, I can get a piece of salmon. You know, I get eggs in the morning. So it, 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 it is a much more convenient diet for sure. Hey, Dave, before we wrap this thing up, I'd love to come back and talk to you on another podcast about bodybuilding specifically sure. and everything that goes into it. I'd love to talk to you about the snakes and stuff like that. And we yeah, want absolutely. to cover, cover, cover the keto stuff. But I know you got a diet seminar coming up down there December 2nd in Cape Coral, Florida. Uh, yep. it's, it's your diet gurus uh, seminar. Mm -hmm. uh, talk about that or, or push that or anything that you want to talk about because I know you're huge oh, yeah. to, at huge285 on Instagram and Twitter uh, yeah. along with your website, davecolombo.com. Along with everything, you go ahead and take the right. take the ball here. <laughs> yeah, I got I got a lot of businesses now. It's, it's, it's very convoluted, but the the bottom line is I do give this uh, secrets to becoming a diet guru seminar. It's a ten hour class. I give it every quarter or so, like every four months, and it basically entails everything you possibly want to know about nutrition, diet, supplementation, performance enhancing drugs, um, everything. It's anything you need to be to be a, a physique coach. And I got news for you. A lot of people who are just not coaches take this this course, just people who want to know about how their body works. The science, it, I call it the instruction booklet for your body. And the great thing about uh, the uh, physique world now is that there's so many new people coming into the physique world because of all the new classes, bikini and figure and fitness and men's physique and classic physique and bodybuilding, that everyone needs coaches. And I know guys that are making well over 150 grand a year uh, from being coached. And you know what? These guys want to know what the science is. No, there's no schools out there that are accrediting people. There's no colleges giving courses on this. So I, I, I set up this course. I sell it out every time. We, we, 
every single time before it comes, we have it, a filled class, and usually there's people ask me when the next one is. So this next one is December 2nd down here in Cape Coral, Florida. My office is here, and you can sign up at DavePalumbo.com. And my DavePalumbo.com is where you can get my coaching. Uh, I sell some some unique products on there as well. My nutrition company, which is SpeciesNutrition.com, you can go on there and see all those products. I have little uh, three-minute videos explaining the science of every product, so I, I think people will find that useful. And then my media website, where I do all my TV programming and all the bodybuilding reporting and fitness reporting, is on RxMuscle.com. And we have a, a terrifically popular YouTube channel, uh, Rx Muscle. We're, we're only 9,000 people away from uh, 100,000. So anyone who's out there, subscribe. Help me get to that 100,000 mark. You probably have, what do you have, like a million on yours? Well, I don't, I don't really have a YouTube channel, but I, I, I got to say, I thoroughly enjoyed, I watched from start to finish, your conversation on Rx Muscle with Boston Lloyd. <laughs> and I know you've had, a few, you've had him on a few times, but I mean, yeah. golly, the one when he was talking about some of the stuff that he was doing, some of the stuff that you were recommending, he pulled yeah. back a little bit, but he's just a very candid, open guy. And I just enjoyed the hell out of it because, again, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the sport. And to, to hear some some of the things that, that, that are out there is just is just flat out <laughs> amazing. And the guy's very candid. I enjoyed the hell out of it. <laughs> you know, of all the people I thought you would mention, I, that was the last name I thought I'd hear from you, but I'm sure he'll be thrilled to know that you. You mentioned him. Oh, I mean, but he seemed like a real knowledgeable guy. Obviously, you know, you two combined. And and the fact that he was so candid. Because a lot of guys, like you said, give you half truths or, you know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But the guy puts it on the table. So I had to respect that. (laughs) I call it radical honesty. Hey, man, uh, it it was great talking with you, Dave. Uh, You've got me uh, tremendous results. Appreciate uh, everything you've done for me. I look forward to continuing working with you in the future. And uh, thanks for taking the time out to do the Steve Austin Show. My pleasure, Steve. All right, everybody, give me the go-home cue. It's time to wrap up this podcast and ride off in the sunset. But before I do, I want to say thank you very much to Dave Palumbo. He is the founder and owner of Species Nutrition. Also, check out his YouTube channel, RX Muscle. It's very entertaining. Dave is a great interview, very knowledgeable. If you're interested in bodybuilding, any kind of nutrition. Also, (laughs) geckos and snakes. The guy is just a wealth of information. It was great talking to him. He has helped me uh, lean up to about, eh, probably about 10% body fat. You can find him on Twitter and Instagram at Huge285. I'll tell you what, man, uh, covered uh, the happenings in Las Vegas. I mentioned in the beginning of the podcast because it was just so devastating. I had to talk about it. Uh, here in the close, I just want to say uh, thank you very much for everybody tuned in to Broken Skull Challenge this past Tuesday with the man. It was an absolutely awesome episode. And the women are coming up this Tuesday. Tonight, if you listen to this on Tuesday, and the women just blow it out of the water. And trust me, this season keeps building from these first two episodes like you will not believe. So just set your DVRs. Don't miss one single episode of Broken Skull Challenge. Because each episode is a standalone episode. But the things that build, the way they happen, just... Man, this ain't, they, this ain't no reality TV. This is a challenge TV show. And just the storylines that happened, the, the efforts and the, the, the triumphs and the tragedies <laughs> that about to happen on Broken Skull Challenge, please set your DVRs. If you got a friend, tell them to tune into the show because it's going to blow your doors off. This is the toughest show on television. I'm proud to be hosting it. Hey, man, all those badass T-shirts that you're going to be seeing me wear this season on Broken Skull Challenge, you can find them at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Steve Austin. And the best damn IPA on the planet, which I enjoy once a week, is Broken Skull IPA at El Segundo Brewing Company. You can find that Broken Skull IPA at Whole Foods and Total Wines if you live in California. And if you ain't in Cali, check inside the seller.com and see if they ship to your state. And if you're looking to get the cold steel broken skull knife or the new working man's knife, because everybody needs a knife, you can get them at my new Amazon store. Amazon has the best price on both knives. Just go to amazon.com forward slash shop forward slash Steve Austin. I want to say thank you to all the fine sponsors of the Steve Austin show. That's how I'm able to do this podcast for you twice a week for free. And you can find all my sponsors at podcast1.com. Just click on the Killer Deals button at the top of the page and then click on the Steve Austin Show banner. And speaking of Podcast One, the new Podcast One app is now available for download at the App Store or Google Play. There ain't another podcast app like this one anywhere, and that's because the new Podcast One app is loaded with some cool features that let you do a lot more than just listen to your favorite shows. You can access behind-the-scenes photos, articles, and connect with other fans of the shows you like. 
And you can watch over 1,000 360 virtual reality videos. You can actually watch some of your favorite shows in virtual reality. It's like you're sitting right in a room with them. So get to the App Store, Google Play, and download the new Podcast One app now. Folks, if you want to follow me on Twitter or Instagram, I am at Steve Austin BSR. I hope that this ketogenic diet podcast has helped you somewhat in trying to find your direction and getting leaner or dropping some body fat. It worked wonders for me, and I'm happy that I did it. Additionally, I'd like to add, if you have any more questions about the ketogenic diet that I undertook, you can send your questions to questions at steveaustinshow.com, and I'll either email you a short answer or try to cover it on the podcast. I am not a rocket scientist after undergoing what I just went through. I'm very happy with the results I got. If you still have more questions, send them to me. I'll answer them for you. Until then, folks, my name is Steve Austin, and I will catch your ass down the road. This has been a Podcast One production. Download new episodes of The Steve Austin Show every Tuesday at podcastone.com. That's podcastone.com. Okay, keep your eyes closed. Okay. I want to show you my first ever painting. Mm, all right. Okay. Open your eyes. Oh, that's a lot of colors mm -hmm. <laughs> and shades. So be honest. What do you think? Well, uh, I like how if you switch to Geico, you could save hundreds of dollars on car insurance. Oh, yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Here, why don't I hold your paintbrush while you call them? Geico, because saving 15% or more on car insurance is always a great answer. The gunman's girlfriend says she hadn't a clue. I'm Jackie Quinn with an AP News Minute. The lawyer who represents Mary Lou Danley says she's cooperating with investigators and reads aloud her statement she didn't know that Stephen Paddock was planning anything and she's heartbroken. I am devastated by the deaths and injuries that have occurred and my prayers go out to the victims. That audio courtesy of ABC News. Police say in addition to the weapons and ammunition in Paddock's Las